Brethren in Christ, Lord A to Jesus Christus and Sequela. This is Timothy Flanders of the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. You're about to watch an interview on the subject of Vatican II, which is a complicated subject with a lot of different factors involved, both theological, disciplinary, faith and morals, as well as political, economic, social uh, factors, sociological, psychological factors, different aspects of this event in church history. And this is a free program, and we're going to have a discussion on this topic tomorrow at 9 a.m. for patrons only. So if you're a patron, you can. we're going to have a live discussion, uh, talk about all your questions about this, talk about Vatican II in more detail. Uh, so you can join that and be a part of a, a live conversation. But that is only available for patrons. So if you become a patron, patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic, you also get a, you can have the opportunity to get a free advanced copy of the new book coming out. Uh, City of God versus City of Man, as well as other free books. So please support the apostolate. Patreon.com slash Meaning of Catholic. Howdy, everyone. Welcome back to Traditional Thomas. For those of you who don't know, my name is Nicholas Cavazos. And today we have a very special guest for me personally on the show, Mr. Timothy S. Flanders from the Meaning of Catholic.com. The Meaning of Catholic is a lay apostolate slash just all around good show that comes out on YouTube that covers a whole host of topics to unite the friends to fight the enemies of Holy Mother Church. So Mr. Mr. Flanders is uh, an ex-Protestant slash ex-Messianic Jew slash <laughs> ex-Eastern Orthodox who converted to Roman Catholicism back in 2013. He has a degree in classical languages from Grand Valley State University, and he does some uh, graduate work with the Catholic University of Ukraine. He also has a fantastic book that I recommend. It's called The Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics, which you can find in the link below, as well as his apostolate's website. So before we get into this very juicy topic that you're all wondering about with the title of this video, Mr. Flanders, how are you doing, sir? Oh, uh, Jesus is king. Thanks, Nicholas, for having me on. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. As I said uh, off air, this is a truly a, yeah, this is really fun for me just to have you on the show, for sure. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, everyone, is this really, really hotly debated subject within traditional and conservative Catholic circles. This idea of what is the theological weight of the Second Vatican Council. And in today, I find that you have two extremes. Uh, on the one hand, you have many, I would call unread traditionalists who will take quotes from Pope Paul VI that says something to the effect of, the Second Vatican Council does not fall under extraordinary magisterium. And so therefore these, these Catholics will say, well, we don't have to accept anything uh, in the Second Vatican Council because it's not infallible. Then on the other hand, you have Catholics who fall into the error that Pope Benedict XVI talks about of making the Second Vatican Council into super dogma. So kind of just ignoring everything that came before the Second Vatican Council and saying that the council fundamentally changed everything. And for me, as an early Catholic, I definitely struggled hearing both of these things. And on the one hand, falling sympathetic to both sides. And it wasn't until I ran across a video by Mr. Mr. Flanders on a, a topic called the theological notes. I'm gonna go ahead also and link that episode in the description too. It's very, very good, I recommend it. Um, but theological notes, what are theological notes and how can the theological notes help us to understand this issue? And so, yeah, I guess my first question to you, Mr. Flanders is um, for most Catholics who do struggle with this uh, and who have maybe never heard of the theological notes, what are the theological notes? Yeah, so the theological notes are essentially different distinctions that are made by theologians and the church, which are different degrees of certainty and binding character of different propositions, whether that's of faith or of morals. And so this is, so for example, an easy thing to, an easy, easy example is the St. Andrew prayer, the Novena of St. Andrew. That you pray every year for Christmas. You, many of your listeners may do that. So it's the uh, blessed be the 
the the night you know and all that and you ask for a you ask for a uh, you know a favor to be granted by god for christmas so that is what's called a pious belief and that is something there's many different pious beliefs in the catholic church that have been passed down for centuries and a pious belief is essentially the lowest one of the lowest degrees of certainty the church doesn't dogmatize something like that. The church doesn't bother with dogmatizing different, different pious beliefs or folk beliefs or folk legends and things like that. These are just great customs and things of the faithful. And so things like that, one, a Catholic sort of is, is free to sort of disbelieve if, if that's sort of a true, if that is really true, if, if God will grant your, 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 uh, petition at Christmas. So that's a basically a pious belief. So something that's piously believed, that the, the church just allows and, and passes down and things like that. May, maybe even lower than that would basically, basically be a tolerated opinion, which would be more or less a little bit controversial. Uh, and I, I, would, I would consider, for example, a tolerated opinion, opinion would be something like libertarian economics. So there's, there's a certain degree of that, and not all of it would be even tolerated. Some of it would be off, beyond the pale, but... Mm -hmm. A lot of like libertarian economic theory would be basically tolerated because it's, it's essentially different theories about the way economic work economics works. And it's, it's sort of, it's only sort of indirectly tied to faith and morals. It's indirectly tied because it's mostly about economics and the way things work. So it's sort of an indirect relationship. So now that's sort of on the lowest end of the spectrum. So those are the, those are the things that are less certain. So therefore, since they're less certain, since we don't really know if they're completely sure or not, they're absolutely true. Well, the church, is, the church is not binding us to that. So they're less binding. So since they're less certain, they're less binding. So you have less of an obligation to believe in that thing um, all the way up to the dogmas of the faith, like the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That would be a de fide proposition. That mm -hmm. would be a dogma. So meaning, if you don't believe in that, you'll go to hell, mm -hmm. assuming you do so willfully, of course. Um, so that would be a dogma of the faith that is necessary for salvation. So and it's so certain, it's absolutely certain it's been dogmatized. It's not only passed down for the apostles, it's now even explicitly dogmatized. And so it's we are the church is absolutely rock solid certain that is absolutely true. From revelation so therefore it is of the highest binding character it is absolutely binding to the highest degree but the the gray area which we'll talk about is that there is a whole spectrum between those two things and so that's the theological notes the theological notes is trying to distinguish between these different degrees of certainty and to clarify what is the binding character of different propositions now to make matters more confusing for the faithful there's also differing opinions among the theologians themselves as to how many theological notes there are so for example so most recently john paul ii in the oath of fidelity in the 1990s he started to distinguish between three theological notes so he would just boil it down all the way to three but then if you read ludwig ott's fundamentals of catholic dogma you get six and then there's other there's other distinctions within that so you can you can make further distinctions and distinctions upon distinctions and so john paul ii kind of boiled it all down and say hey we, let's just simplify it all into th these three categories but essentially it's th that's what theological notes are, are trying to do but i think um as we'll talk about it gets really confusing especially when we talk about the second vatican council yeah absolutely i find um Whenever I was studying it myself, looking at Ludwig Ott's six categories, so to speak, I found your um, perspective on do most of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, do they fall under a sententia communis or a sententia probabilis um, to be very interesting. Um, it, but it made sense because even just looking at the appendices of Lumen Gentium and saying that, okay, this is a common consensus of the Council Fathers on these documents really made it, I guess, boiled it down and made it make sense to me. When it comes to issues, um, do you think, do you think, 
and I think I know the answer to this, but do you think that you can really take the Second Vatican Council and just put it into one of these camps? Why or why not? No, you cannot put it into all one because even, and that was already true of Nicaea, because mm -hmm. Nicaea has Nicaea has two things. It has the Nicene Creed, first mm -hmm. of all, which is dogma, and then it has canons. Mm -hmm. And canons are, by definition, disciplinary things. A canon is a law. So Nicaea made laws. So by definition, those are ecclesiastical laws, and they are disciplinary, which means they are put in force to preserve the faith and morals of the church in a given situation based on truths of the faith. So they may be sort of very dogmatic in character in the sense of like they made they made canons about if you are this sort of heretic, then we're not going to rebaptize you. But if you're this sort of heretic, we will. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a dogmatic in character. But then there's other canons that are very disciplinary in terms of like the way you fast, for example. That's something that changes over time. So uh, that's no we can never really take, I don't, I can't think of a single council. I mean, it, you'd have to have a single council, maybe, maybe Constantinople one. I don't, I don't know if there's, well, there's a few canons in that council too. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, not, no councils are coming to mind that actually do not have multiple levels of this. Yeah. And so, so then you, so there's already this sort of confusion if, if you're not, you know, if you're not skilled in all this and whatnot. And, this is there's still other so many other factors to, to to get into here but vatican ii is also a it's a it's a pastoral council now now some people want to say well that's that's totally wrong you, you you've never had a pastoral council that well that's not true either because mm -hmm. every single ecumenical council is called uh not always but many are called to address some heresy but then while the bishops are all together, they all say, well, why don't we just deal with all this other pastoral stuff too, while we're all together? So mm -hmm. that's, this is the canons that I'm talking about. So, I mean, there's still pastoral, you know, decisions. So, but primarily Vatican II primarily is not focused so much on, it's basically in, in its best intention that is, de that is described by John, John the 23rd is essentially trying to present the faith in a new way in order to win over modern man. That's essentially the basic concept of it so it's not really trying to dogmatize new things or clarify new doctrine per se although there are certain aspects of that uh it's primarily trying william marshner is, is the the adroit he very adroitly summarizes vatican ii i think and william marshner if you don't know who it viewers don't know who that is he is the founder of christendom college and he is he would not be considered a quote-unquote trad he's he would be considered like sort of a quote unquote conservative, if you like, but he is a, a, an impeccable scholar. And he says that Vatican II basically is not really a change of dogma, but basically a change of policy. And when the church cha changes policy, then what is our level of assent? He says, well, our level of, of assent is we're not assenting to a, a faith and morals like we are like with Vatican I or with Trent. We're not dogmatizing faith and morals so much as we're changing a, a pastoral policy. We're going to try something new. So what is the level of assent? William Marshner says, our level of, of assent is not to give our assent, but to basically give it a chance. So we want to basically, we are called in obedience to, to give it a chance, to basically try it out, obediently work with the same method of sort of pastoral approach. And, but it is, sort of primarily the overall sort of pastoral approach, which is shifting in Vatican II, is essentially of a disciplinary character because it's essentially applying this medicine of mercy concept that John, John XXIII talks about in his opening address. So essentially saying, hey, the modern world is all secularized. We've been condemning them for four generations. They haven't converted. They've just gotten worse. And also John XXIII says, he thinks that they're actually kind of starting to be more rational ironically he thinks that they will actually figure out their own errors mm -hmm. so he's reading the signs of the times quote unquote in this way and so then the, the so he's thinking that we can just if we just present the faith and say hey here's what the faith is the modern man will just be so won over by this truth that they'll just convert so that of uh, really the best intentions uh, among the best possible interpretations sort of reading everything in the best possible light 
that's kind of the intention. So that, so that's sort of the policy of Vatican II. So in that sense, in this sort of overarching, and this is oversimplified, we're oversimplifying the council here, but we're trying to get the general pastoral approach or a change of policy. So we are, as Catholics, we should give that a chance. We shouldn't just say, well, I disagree on my own authority, and I'm just going to throw out the council immediately. Mm-hmm. That, that would be an impious thing to do as a Catholic, because you cannot just go ahead and disagree with whatever a bishop says just because on your own authority. It, it, the main thing is on whose authority? The bishop has an authority to do something. The, the church has an authority to do something. And you're a layman. So you can't just say, well, I'm just going to, I disagree on my own authority. Now, so you are called to give it a chance. No, so the whole debate basically, or at least much of the debate boils down to, has Vatican II, does it need to be basically implemented? It's never really been implemented. The policy has never really been really tried. We got to really do the policy. And once we do the policy, it'll, it'll win over the modern world. Or do we need to, this policy has been completely ineffective. We need to change course and change policy again. Just like Vatican II said, hey, this wasn't working. I'm going to change policy. Well, now we're saying, well, Vatican II is not working. We want to change policy again. So that's, that's kind of the debate on a very pastoral level before we get into a bunch of distinctions in terms of the theology. No, I thought that that's a brilliant way to summarize it. Going to just three of these, quote, policies, um, the Society of St. Pius X has always stated that uh, they can harmonize the teaching of Vatican II with the, with the tradition um, in different ways, except on three points. And these points are the issues of ecumenism, religious liberty, and collegiality. And so just in my own reading of the documents, I understand the perspective that they're coming from whenever you read the documents in their totality, and you go back and you read uh, different sources. Uh, So just like, let's just take one as an example, the issue of religious liberty. Would you say that uh, in a general sense, uh, when it comes to issues like, does man have a, a, you know, a civil right, a natural right to um, follow his conscience to the point of, you know, believing whichever religion he so deems to be correct. Would you say that these, um, under the sentencia communis um, mode of thinking, would constitute as um, definitely, definitely warranting question, so to speak? It's definitely a, a place to where we can question um, how well this is going. Yeah, cer- yeah, certainly on the policy level, um, mm-hmm. just if we talk about this as a policy, meaning mm-hmm. basically the, the, the liberal revolutions mm-hmm. since 1776 have been asserting that there needs to be freedom of religion. There, can be, there cannot be any state religion, no, no state cultists. There needs to be freedom of religion for everybody. So the church has condemned that again and again and again. And if we're just talking about a change of policy, like we're not going to condemn that so much. We're going to kind of try to find some common ground with that and see if that works to win them over. That's that's on the one hand, we can debate whether or not that that approach is effective. Mm-hmm. Um, so just on a policy level. So, yeah, I, certainly churchmen with grave cause and with proper piety. We don't. The, one of the problems is that people just run their mouth off and they sort of mock our own superiors as mm-hmm. if, if we're we're going to act like Protestants and call the Pope the Antichrist like Luther did. Mm-hmm. You know, we shouldn't be doing, we shouldn't be calling people names. That's impious. That's sinful. Mm-hmm. But with grave cause and with proper reverence and piety, we may respectfully submit. And in fact, the Second Vatican Council says such things uh, that the laity should voice their opinions. So if we do so respectfully and say, I, I think that this policy is not working, can we switch over to a new policy? That's certainly that's certainly uh, completely allowed and completely licit to be done if it's a, if it's just a matter of policy. Now, the difficulty with religious liberty is that as for, so my, my new book is called City of God versus City of Man. And in that, we talk about the tradition of so-called religious liberty, which is essentially toleration, uh, which in particular started with the Jews in Christendom, Mm -hmm. which is where the church formed sort of this public charter with the Jews to protect them from any violence. 
by giving them their own area where they could live in as a community and they could have freedom of religion in the sense that they could just be Jews in their area and we're not going to go in to disturb their synagogue and disturb their rights what they're whatever they're doing no one's going to do that and that and that's not that's not lawful and so the church is actually saying that's that's illegal that's unlawful to go into the Jew Jewish community and stop their rights even though we say that their religion is actually denying Jesus Christ. So we actually do say that it is a false religion. So the church is tolerating this. It's giving them, and this is going back to St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Gregory the Great. So he's the one who really starts this in a, in a real way. And, but the Jews have this protection and that the church is officially going to protect them from any sort of unlawful, um, you know, messing with their religion or stopping their religion as long as they in turn do the same for the overall society, mm -hmm. because the overall society must be devoted to the true King, Jesus Christ, the King. So this, the, the flashpoint with the Jews and the Christians, of course, is usury. So the church laws are against usury. And so no Christian can practice usury. If you, you were a user or you were excommunicated, you were anathematized, all sorts of things. And so the, the condition was essentially we'll give you freedom of religion as long as you respect our laws and the whole society is devoted to Christ the King. So there is a strong traditional precedent for a form of religious freedom. And, and there's always been at also in the, the fundamental level, like Dignitatis Humanae, Dignitatis Humanae is talking about the fundamental natural law allowance for the freedom of conscience one one needs to be free to accept the gospel freely no one can ever be forced to be baptized mm -hmm. and that's been that that right there is a true that's a constant teaching of the church from the very beginning there's always been a hesitant there's always been a temptation of christian kings to basically mm -hmm. force the matter force pagans or whatever charlemagne did it uh and the saints have always been against this it's, it's a constant teaching of the church and so the problem is you do have this strong tradition of sort of, on the one hand, we have this freedom of religion in this legacy with the Jews. Later on, it, it happens with Protestants. There's certain precedents for that. So there's a sense of that. And then there's also a sense, a very strong tradition that one should never be forced to be baptized. So we then have the document of Dignitas Humanae, which begins with, the stipulation that societies must be obl they're obliged to worship the true king and then it goes on to say certain things um but it is not entirely clear if you if one reads the document the the difficulty is that in the liberal context in the post-liberal context in the year 1963 the american empire is the one who's defining what religious liberty is all across the world. They have the most sophisticated psychological warfare going on with the CIA and all sorts of things. We don't even know all the archives, got to go through everything to find out all the stuff they did at that time. But basically the media was being controlled to such a large extent by the American empire that they were the ones defining all these terms. So, any, so basically anybody who's living in that time and even in that, even in our own era, is going to have all these slogans and all these things going through their head. And then that's the lens through which they're going to read this document. And so they're going to immediately think the document is talking about American style religious liberty, where it's just a total free for all. There's no whatever. And this is exact, this is actually what John Courtney Murray was trying to promote at the council. Mm -hmm. This is actually what, and he had connections with the CIA and whatnot. And this is not a conspiracy theory. People, people can read this text right here. <laughs> Anytime you talk about the CIA, you, you start to get those accusations. Mm -hmm. This is John Courtney Murray, Time Life, American Propositions, David Wemhoff. He went around and dug up all these archives. And you, you can read it right in the archives. The CIA is, is planning all of this stuff. It's, it's right there. They, they, they planned it all out. So it's not, it's not some kind of weird theory. But so... The problem is if you look at this document and you have the strong historical mindset and the theological mindset, and you basically have to ignore everything that's going on around you in the modern world, and then you have to read the document kind of like that, mm -hmm. 
and very few even bishops are even able to read it that way because they're reading the media everything's just floating around like it was at that time as it is today so it's so very easy to read things like the things that it says in Dignitatis Humanae regarding a civil right to promote and propagate your religion well what would it what on earth does that mean does that mean a in, in sort of this Christendom model, the Jew can just go and promote his Pharisaic Judaism or, or the heretic mm-hmm. can go around and just can try to convert Catholics all around Christendom. Is that what that means? Mm-hmm. And, and this is the type of questioning that we can, we can do as Catholics. We need to be, uh, there needs to be a pious reaction in the sense that we read something that doesn't make sense from the magisterium. It doesn't make sense to us because it doesn't really add up. Doesn't that, doesn't that contradict what we just talked about? Doesn't that contradict this and this and this? Well, that's when we submit a dubia. That's mm-hmm. what the pious Catholic does. We don't, we, don't, we don't say, oh, well, this is a contradiction. And immediately I'm going to become a set of contest because I think I, because you're relying, relying so much on your private judgment. Mm-hmm. You're, you're saying, I, re- I read these two things and they seem to contradict. Therefore, I know that they contradict. I'm right. The church is wrong. You know, that's the type of attitude that Catholics should not have. We need to, we need to trust the church. We need to obey the church. And if something doesn't make sense, we need to say, Holy Father, Your Excellency, Your Grace, Reverend Father, whoever in authority, please explain what you mean by that, because I want to submit myself to the authority of the church. And that's the attitude that we need as Catholics. But the problem that we then have is that on sur- a various various points of this controversy and others, there has not been sufficient clarity. And so you still have bishops today across the world who are promoting American style of religious liberty. And if we're talking about American style of religious liberty, how could that possibly be what Dignitatis Humanae says? And this mm. is kind of what the SSPX is, from, from what I can tell, what they're trying to highlight here is that if, if we say, okay, can this document be technically correct in terms of uh, like a kind of a technicality, like we can technically make it work? Mm-hmm. Maybe on a theological sort of in theory level, but pastorally, de facto across the whole world, what's actually being taught through this document are all these heresies. This basically this American style indifferentism. So maybe, maybe we could even concede, okay, it's, yeah, we could, uh, you know, we could make it work in theory. And, mm-hmm. you know, you get your three theologians with PhDs and you can all agree it's correct mm-hmm. in your high tower of PhD, but the common man and the, even the bishops across the world, they are actually interpreting this heretically, basically. They're using this document and teaching indifferentism and teaching American style religious liberty. So that's what, that's what I, at least as I understand SSPX critique is that these, these words are basically so insufficient they're so deficient in terms of their rock solid clarity to avoid because the, the magisterium does have a duty to teach. The magisterium needs, has a duty to teach. It has a duty to clarify and make things rock solidly clear so that it's not misinterpreted. And that's the, the now there, there has been some clarifications from the Vatican on this and I don't have them memorized there. I know there was one, I think it was, um, I think it was in the 2000s. I can't remember, but there, I know there is, there is uh, at least one clarification on Dignitatis Humanae, which uh, basically says that it is not, uh, it is not trying to teach an indifferentism, which is good. This is so. This is like a, a good clarification. There's mm-hmm. another uh, on another topic on ecumenism. On uh, there's Dominus Jesus, which is a very very good document, which helped to clarify. Um, but the problem is the magisterium just not only has not only has the duty to clarify, it has the duty to enforce that clarification. By means of the anathema and the excommunication. And that's especially what's not happening. Mm-hmm. And that's especially what the sort of the trad movement is trying to say we need. Uh, we need this anathema to try to really rein in this vast uh, spread as uh, what uh, Dietrich von Hildebrand said, the devastated vineyard, where, where the picture of just the wolves scattering the vineyard. And that's, that's exactly what's happening. We have wolves destroying the vineyard of the Lord. And we have churchmen who are doing nothing because they're not using their apostolic authority to excommunicate, to protect the children from the wolves. So 
that's a long-winded end answer. I hope that gets at what you were trying to get at. No, absolutely. That, that answers that and more. So I see how on the one hand, a lot of people, yeah, I think that we've clearly established that this kind of idea of super dogma is just, it's too easy to, you know, to, to accept on the one hand. I mean, you can accept it without a lot of study. And then on the other hand, you can really just fall into this trap of just saying, okay, well, Vatican II is not extraordinary magisterium. Therefore, I can pick and choose what I want, that both of those things are incorrect. Um, I like how you've you know divided these things up. One thing I kind of want to finish on is while you have a lot of liberals who um, will really just fight tooth and nail uh, for the super dogma, you also have a lot of people in the traditional circles that are de facto um, and not open, but de facto set of provincialists. So, you know, this idea that, okay, well, the Pope is a valid Pope. However, he doesn't have any authority because, you know, he's teaching modernist heresy or something along that nature. Um, could you go ahead and enlighten what, why is that position wrong uh, in your opinion? Certainly. Um, well, we, essentially the, the the basis of the church is the tradition the tradition tradition is the one authority in the church which is passed down through both the liturgy the mass and the faith and the bishops are its guardian and we need to have a disposition of humility and submission to all of our hierarchy that just needs to be a constant disposition but with the caveat that we have a higher disposition of faith to assent to the divine deposit of faith. So there is a hierarchy of assent. Obviously, the, the faith comes first because that's directly from God. And then we submit to our, our rulers, our leaders. And there is, however, a strong Jansenist spirit that has continued in the church and Jansenism is was a, essentially a, an infiltration of the church from within by her own members who were turning to more Protestant theories and the church continually tried to root this out this was from in the year in the 1600s all the way up to the French Revolution, and especially in, even in the 1900 with uh, Pius X, the reason that we have frequent communion, for example, is because of the Jansenists. But the, the Jansenists were essentially trying to promote their theories against ecclesiastical authority and trying to find, they were basically trying, they were not acting in good faith. They were trying to find technicalities which would rationalize their disobedience and their lack of submission to ecclesiastical authority. So we need to study the Jansenists and not imitate their, so, their same spirit of rebellion and to tr just try to find this technicality because, because essentially that's the easy way out, essentially, is because I found a contradiction in this document, this document, and I feel uncomfortable with that. I feel suffering, and it's going to take a lot of study and wrestling or whatever to figure out what's going on there. And I certainly don't want to see it from the other point of view, because then I have to be, re it's really difficult because that requires a lot of humility and intellectual humility is, is one of the hardest humilities to have because you're really subordinating your own opinions to a higher somebody else. Um, and that's very difficult for all of us. I mean, it's difficult. Um, so it's really easy to just, fall into this de facto set of privationism where I'm just going to ignore everything. Now, in a sense, that's true. We do need to ignore some things in the sense that we live in a time where the Pope is speaking all the time. You, have, you can read a news report about his daily homilies. And this is completely unnecessary as Catholics. We simply, this is really, this is what I call in my book, the false spirit of Vatican I, which is where just everything revolves around the Pope. And that is not, we should not be constantly trying to just get information from the Pope. That's not necessary. And it can be harmful because we just forget about the actual faith, like the catechism of Trent or whatever. So there is a sense where we do need to sort of ignore 
and just not focus so much on every single thing the Pope said. I mean, most people don't have time to read a 200 page encyclical every time it comes out a few years. It's maybe, you know, it's difficult to find time for that all the time. So mm -hmm. on the other hand, this de, de facto set of probationism is essentially, it's, it's basically, it is a schismatic mentality because there is a lack of charity because some, some will say, Hey, well, this person accepts Vatican II, or this person comes to a different conclusion, or this bishop or this pope comes to this conclusion or that conclusion. And I've already have a set conclusion as to what I think is the truth, having read six books about it. And I know I'm right. So therefore, I'm just going to ignore anybody who may come to a different conclusion. Mm -hmm. And we don't live in a time where these all these questions have been resolved. They, they may not be resolved before we die, Nicholas. Uh, we live in a period like the Aryan crisis, like uh, like the Great Western Schism. And even in the Aryan crisis, there were actually two different Orthodox parties. There were there was the Athanasian party that was pro-Nicene, pro-Homonousios, but there was actually an Orthodox anti-Nicene party that didn't like the terminology of the Nicene creed. They didn't like that because they thought it was civilianism. And so they were actually had to be won over and people, people like St. Basil the Great were among this party. And so uh, things needed to be worked out, fleshed out, clarified, explained. And so we need to not be so quick to judge our brother who may be coming to a different conclusion. Um, the de facto set of probationism Set of privationism is essentially the 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 idea that there is a there is a valid bishop of Rome, there's a valid valid bishop. They're really bishops. They're really successors of the apostles, but they somehow they don't have authority. Well, that that right there is an innovation. That is an error because you just invented that. <laughs> I mean, no one's ever taught that in the history of the church until now. So you just invented an error. You just invented an innovation. In an attempt to avoid innovations, you just invented your own invent innovation. So that's a difficult position to be in. Now, again, sometimes there are new clarifications that can happen because the church encounters unprecedented situations. So to be fair to the set of probationists, there are certain clarifications I, I certainly personally think that there will be, after this crisis is resolved sometime, please God, within the next hundred years, mm -hmm. there will be some kind of clarification as to what is the Pope's authority regarding some certain things or, or certain dispute. There are disputed areas of the Pope's authority that are not resolved. And the, the precise, you know, can the Pope become a heretic in this way or that way, or can he err in this way or that way? There are areas that have not been clarified. So I think that there could be errors that will become clear, clear. But most of all, it's it's really a moral problem because there's it is a lack of virtue, essentially. Um, both intellectual virtue and the virtue of justice, the virtue of piety, giving giving due honor to one's elders. Um, I want to read uh, this text because this is this is the key. This is one of the key ones uh, that I wanted to share, which um, is relevant to our discussion here. And that's the syllabus of errors number 22. And this is in the newest edition of Denziger, number 2922. So this is the, th I'm gonna read, this is the condemned proposition. So what I'm about to say is an error, okay? Mm -hmm. So here's the condemned proposition, condemned. The obligation by which Catholic teachers and writers are absolutely bound is restricted to those matters only that are proposed by the infallible judgment of the church to be believed by all as dogmas of faith. So anytime someone is running around saying, oh, well, that's not infallible, I can disagree with that. That's mm -hmm. actually the same attitude they had with Humanae Vitae. That's exactly what they were saying. They said, oh, well, it's not infallible. Let's just disagree with that. That's what they were saying then. And so we can't fall into the same axiom of saying, well, if it's not infallible, we can just dismiss it. Well, so this is what we're trying to say with these theological notes. So like Vatican II, no, it did not dogmatize new faith and morals. 
some argue that there was a clarification on the sacramentality of the bishop and various other things. Sure, okay. There are certain dog doctrine or doctrinal teachings, of course. But primarily, it's a, it's a pastoral council. It's trying to change this policy, like we talked about. So, but just because it's not a dogma, that does not mean that we just throw out the council per se or throw out the council before we even understand it. How many people who criticize Vatican II have read all the documents? There's a lot of documents. It's a long, long council. And how many of your propositions have you read the clarifications from the Vatican? I would wager that many have not actually read through all those documents and tried to understand them. So until you do that, you do not have the right to critique. Now you may read the, the whole thing and then you do have a critique. Great. Well, submit a dubia, do this piously, offer this, and the church will clarify. And there's been clarifications in response to this. We just need to do so and still promote the pious spirit of a Catholic and not create scandal with, with the weaker brethren, people, you know, you know pious uh, Catholics who are, you know, not getting into a bunch of theological squabbles. They're just trying to save their soul. And if you just start go around saying who knows what about the Pope, that may be a scandal to the little ones, mm -hmm. meaning uh, a scandal is an occasion of spiritual ruin. And our Lord said, as, as your viewers may know, he had very strong words to say about those who scandalize the little ones. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be very careful and we need to promote piety with, with, our, with our workings out of Vatican II. It's not clear. Some things are not clear. There's a lot of confusion. So we need to work these things out, but we need to do it properly in a way that piously preserves the authority of the church and not, doesn't promote this sort of set up probationist idea because what's, what's the end goal? How do you get out of that? What's, I mean, if there's no Pope or if the Pope's lost his authority, well, how does he, how does he regain his authority then? Mm -hmm. Are you going to consecrate uh, a new Pope or what's the plan? And then they all disagree on how to even do that. Mm -hmm. So now we're in, a, in, in an even worse place now. So we've, we've, gone from, we've gone from, okay, we have confusion, but at least we have an authority and we're trying to work it out to now we're splintering into a million pieces because we don't even know who even has the authority to answer the question and clarify. So it's, it's a very difficult position to be in. And we need to have hope that uh, the church will clarify these things and, and we can work these things out as men of God and it'll take time and a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Final question for you is if you had to give your, I guess this might be a little bit impossible, but prediction for the next 100 years of the church and how you think the crisis in the church will be solved. Um, in your opinion, what do you, how do you think that will look? How will that entail? <laughs> Well, I, as, I, as I say in my book, um, there's just every new crisis is unprecedented. And then there's so, so many times in the period of the church, people think that the end of the world is happening. And with good reason. You have the Mohammedan invasion destroy the whole church in a couple generations. People think the world is ending. Mohammed is the Antichrist. So they're not, and it's not even that, you know, think about the period. That was a sort of a rational conclusion. You know, you wouldn't be crazy if you thought that. And they, they thought the same thing during the Western Catechism and Black Death, one third of Europe died. So, so we're in a situation where, okay, well, it could be the end of the world. We don't know that. Maybe that maybe the end of the world will happen. Okay, well, that's 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 option one. That might happen. <laughs> um, well, option two, what could happen? Well, um, as we know, the new generation of Catholics and the, the next generation, basically the enthusiasm of the 1960s was not passed down to the next generation. That mindset, my, my uh, partner in the fight, Kennedy Hall, called, called Vatican II the post-war council. And I think that was so excellent because it's very a post. It's much, very much a post-war mentality. It's it's a mentality of the time. They thought it would work, and 
if, if we had more Orthodox bishops who went back to their diocese, and some of them did, like in Lincoln or Campos in various places, or even in Poland, like John Paul II it, against the communists in Poland, Poland is, is still Catholic to this day. You know, Vatican II was not all bad in every case, in every place, because some Orthodox bishops were actually doing a good job, sort of, uh, you know, going back to the diocese. Um, but the enthusiasm has not been passed down to the next generation. Um, now we have all of the children that were conceived in, under John Paul II because all of these Catholic families were learning about the beauty of Catholic marriage and they were having a lot of children and they were faithful Catholics. Now we have those children, the children who were born in John Paul II's era. They, they are the people now coming, becoming priests and they are the next generation of clergy and at this point, there's not the same enthusiasm that was very historically, it was very, you know, it, it was a fad and it just didn't stick. So I think we, we many of us know that the, the enthusiasm of Vatican II is waning. It's waning. Um, it essentially... I, I, me personally, my personal opinion is that Vatican II is very much like Lateran V that mm -hmm. happens right before the Protestant revolt because, mm -hmm. because it happened before the revolution. Vatican II happened and then the sexual revolution happened and then our whole society changed. So how can you have a council that happened before the problem deal with the problem? You, that's, that's, that's nonsensical. You need to have a, an, a, an approach and a church event that deals with the problem itself mm -hmm. after the problem arises. And so now we have all this problem. All, all, I mean, the, the world of 2021 is so much different than the world of 1965, mm -hmm. completely different. It's a completely different world in so many different ways. So Vatican II is rapidly losing its relevance in terms of its effectiveness and its relevance to this pastoral situation that we have now. So all of that to say, is that we see with the history of the Latin mass, with the history of the restoration of tradition, we have this grassroots movement among priests and families to restore tradition, or at least be orthodox in the John Paul II sense. That's what's really making people renounce marriage. People typically don't wanna renounce marriage for social justice. I want to renounce marriage to be a social justice warrior. Well, you can just go, you know, join some Marxist organization. You don't have to renounce marriage for that. Mm -hmm. But what's really, what's really making people renounce marriage now. So obviously we know this is growing, but the money is still with this wicked pornocracy of the elites who are running things in various sectors of the Vatican and the hierarchy. So the money is still flowing freely with that group and they have tons of power and they're still able to appoint bishops throughout the world. And so this is not, even though there's sort of this biological solution where all oh, the trads have a bunch of kids and, you know, they kind of take over over time. There's still a, a lot of war to be fought over the next 100 years because there is so much power and they, because they have so much money and power, when you have money and power, you can manipulate people with the media. And as we saw last year in 2020, we saw the power of the media and technology to really manipulate the masses with the blink of an eye. It's, it's really quite remarkable and, and stunning what they can really do. So that includes a great deal of the faithful of the church. So people are going to continue going to church because it's a habit, because they feel good, because of all sorts of reasons. And they're going to still have this, mo this modernist mindset and whatever, whatever the modern world is telling them, they're still going to have that mentality. And mm -hmm. there's still going to be priests who still come into the seminary who still have that mentality and still want to change things and still want to be like James Martin and various people like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be as easy as just having a bunch of kids and increasing these numbers. This is, this is going to be a, a hundred year battle or more. Um, so it's not going to be easy. Um, but there's a lot of hope because there is this strong generation because more and more the, the powerful elites 
running the church are going to have to resort to more and more sort of desperate measures. And that's mm -hmm. how many are seeing Tradiciones Custodes, mm -hmm. just, sort of not, just cutting down the Latin mass at this point, because they, they can't, there's not, there's not a stronger way to deal with the problem because the strongest way to overcome and convert is through cultural generativity, uh, generational, th these families. And if we just resort to pure power and just trying to force people to do something, they will then refuse to do it because then, then we're talking about Dignitas Humanae, trying to force people to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what doesn't work. It doesn't, mm -hmm. you, you can't convert people. You can't convert hearts and minds by forcing people to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so what really creates the zeal, that zeal for the faith in the hearts and minds is the tradition, is the faith. So um, in the next hundred years, I, I definitely think that uh, various, there will be continual African uh, conversions. Africa in the past hundred years went through the mat most massive conversion in the history of the church. They went from, they had a, a thousand percent, I think it's a thousand percent increase in Catholics over a hundred years. It was a massive conversion and they're still booming. And so then they're sending missionaries. We have an African priest at our, our parish right now. They're sending missionaries to us. So the Africans are going to start mi sending missionaries everywhere. <laughs> so we're going to just get some more Africans. And mm -hmm. we love the African spirit. And this is, this is what's beautiful is that the African spirits already been through so much oppression and mm -hmm. so, and they just do it joyfully. And so they're, they're just, they're going to come and, and fill our parishes with more and more priests as time goes on. And that's that true Catholic African spirit. It's going to, is going to meld with the zeal of, of these traditionalists. And that's, that's sort of my prediction, I guess, if you want me to make one um, is that uh, that will continue to grow um, as long as, the Africans resist the uh, Western domination of their economies and their ideas, which uh, the more Africans get smartphones, the, the more they'll become like us and, and you know, mind melt, mind controlled and all this nonsense. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a great battle. And, and, but this is a, this is an exciting time to be a Catholic over the next 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, it's an exciting time to be a Catholic because this is this is the fight that uh, all our fathers fought and they passed down the faith and they they died and suffered joyfully mm -hmm. because they knew they were passing down the faith to their children. So that's that's my uh, that is my final word and that's that's what I say in my book, City of God versus City of Man, coming out soon. Um, that is what I I present as as our hope is that we can pick up this mantle and we can fight and we can conquer as our fathers already did. Amen to that. I definitely look forward to reading your book once it comes out. It sounds like it's going to be a very interesting read. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. And thank you, Mr. Flanders, for coming on the show. I thoroughly, thoroughly appreciate it. Again, you guys can all check the links in the description below for his website, for his YouTube channel, and then also for his amazing book, an introduction to the Holy Bible for traditional Catholics. And as always, everyone, may our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, and St. Joseph watch over and protect you. God bless.